good morning church and uh, it's wonderful to be here the last time i was here 6 week back 6 weeks back also it was a lesser crowd i don't know if uh, people are running away when they hear i'm coming up hope not hope you can hear me at the back and hope it's not too shiny for the camera okay so where are we acts thank you okay we are in efficiency yeah so last week we had a wonderful uh, overview of efficiency and uh, we could see how the church uh, which is in ephesus how it came about and uh, that was because paul came to ephesus and he was there for three full years and when he was there in ephesus initially he went to the synagogue and he you know as he usually does and he tried convincing them from uh in the synagogue to the jews trying to help them understand that uh let me just put a timer so i don't go overboard yeah so he convinces them about who christ is and when he talks about his death and resurrection that is when they say whoa 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 everything else is fine but this resurrection bit we don't we're not going to uh, take it so easily so what is what does he do he moves away from there and he goes to the school of Tyrannus and there he's teaching for two full years and what does he do in two years he's reasoning in the school of Tyrannus and he's reasoning with them about who this holy spirit is and who uh, lord jesus is and how you can be empowered by the holy spirit if you accept the lord jesus christ as your savior and you know we see that this uh, uh, city rome is uh, sorry ephesus is a roman capital in that area of asia minor so we have asia a large part and we have asia minor a small portion and that almost touches europe so all trade used to come from asia go through asia minor by land and reach ephesus ephesus was a center of trade from there from the harbor it would go to europe and to rome i'm not saying this for gk or geography it's important for what we're going to learn okay so this is what uh, where we are at and uh, ephesus uh, is uh, also a strong community of 250000 people uh, we also heard a uh, few weeks back and last week of how it's a place where there's a lot of pagan worship also you know the temple of diana one of the largest temples uh, built was there so as we go further i'd just like to just read uh, uh, one verse in acts 19 uh, which 17 which says so the word of god grew mightily and prevailed the word of god grew mightily in the city of ephesus okay and after after paul leaves there there is aquila and apollos and apostle john and many people who continue to minister to the people at ephesus so it is a place where the church is thriving okay and um, and before i go any further into the text itself i just want to read two verses to help us understand the abrahamic covenant we are going to go back maybe one and a half years back where we studied this this was at the the whole council of god and the whole council of god we understood that the abraham abrahamic covenant is a covenant where god promised abram that was his name earlier abram and that he will be uh, a chosen nation and that's in genesis 12 1 to 3 it says the lord said to abram go from your country your people and your father's family go to the land i will show you and i will make you a great nation and i will bless you and doesn't stop that it says and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you now when this covenant is being reassured to him or reaffirmed to him in genesis 22 he gives more god gives more clarity to abraham and abraham understands it but the nation of israel doesn't seem to understand it because they think that this covenant is only meant for them remember the 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 covenant to adam and the covenant to noah covenant to adam was that mankind would be saved through the seed of man now that the jews accept is for all mankind they also accept that the covenant with noah is for all of mankind but some of this abrahamic covenant they hold dear saying you know this is only for the jews right and you know they try to argue through it but in genesis 22 uh, uh, verse 18 it says in your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed so let's just remember that verse when we go forward and i'll just read uh, renald e shaws 
he's a theologian and what he says about the abrahamic covenant is this the abrahamic covenant or promise included a universal promise of blessing to all families of the earth all families of the earth through abraham's seed singular the fulfillment of this promise involved the coming of the redeemer and the provisions of salvation to all peoples of the earth okay now we're going to go to the text so all of you have your bibles please open to ephesians 1 we're going to read it from verse 3 all of you have pencils or anything to underline it will be good to underline because this is one power packed passage okay this is one of my favorite passages you asked me a few years back to preach from it i would not have uh but uh by the by the infinite will of god my name came next to this and i did not want to argue with anyone or change it but this is a power packed passage and it requires a lot of prayer um meditation reading rereading and every time you read it something new pops up okay so uh, i just want all of us to be focused uh when you first read it, it, it you know it, it it's it's a bit too much but if you really break it down and really prayerfully look at it it's a beautiful passage and uh, i i i hope i'm able to uh, do some justice to it and help uh, help us understand what i have learned and trust me there is much more you can learn from this so the first verse which is verse 3 and you know there is also uh some points if you can towards the end tell me how many times uh you know joby touched on it joby also stole my song i wanted that song to be sung before but by the uh again leading of the holy spirit that same song out of 500 songs is what we sung you know the gift of god and the gift of grace is jesus my redeemer so um you know every and you remember, remember joby said everything revolves under that phrase in christ through christ and i want you all to as we don't don't count now okay as we go through the passage mark it understand it children you also you have to tell me how many times okay in christ through christ by christ in him all of these keep repeating and this is to reaffirm to us that he is central to our salvation to our re- redemption so let's read the first verse which is in verse 3 blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in christ now if you look at that verse i we could have even um, you know paul could have just read the uh, written the verse saying blessed be god the father who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing but he was very specific to call out the father of our lord jesus christ and end it with in him and this sets the stage for us and you know this spiritual blessing is just not any normal blessing it is every spiritual blessing in heavenly places now when when we read this we shouldn't think oh god is going to bless us immensely through all material blessings we can ask for because we are his child now this has nothing to do with material or immaterial blessings or emotional blessings it is spiritual blessings which are stored for us in heavenly places for christ and we will look at that right we will look at all the blessings as we go through these verses in romans 8:34 it says it is christ who died and furthermore is also risen and he is at the right hand of god and also makes intercession for us and we see here christ at the right hand of god right the nlt says he is sitting at a place of honor at god's right hand pleading for us pleading for us so he is our inheritance and treasure in heaven pleading for each one of us and this is one of the great blessings to know that everything is held together in christ verse 4 i have not put the verse on the slide so all of you have to look down into your bibles when i say verse 4 and read it along with me please okay verse 4 god the father chose us before the world was created that's what this verse is going to say just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy without blame before him in love now you see here we see that god chose us okay he chose us he removes any chance of any merit from any one of us it is not us who chose him but he chose us so he gets all the due merit for that and there is no action which was upon us 
and you know jesus you have chosen me right so that is what we have to understand that you have chosen me it is not that i have chosen you now you know the problem with election is immediately people will jump up and say hey where is free will in this you know you know what, what what doesn't my free will have anything to do with all of this why not me i'm also involved in all of this in this process you know but the problem is the thinking is and 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 with that thinking comes oh you know what i can't understand it so i'm not going to deal with this but that is a wrong thinking because that is a thinking of a fallen man but we have to understand that god is omniscient right he is a god who knows everything and his plane of thinking is completely different than what is ours and you know the elect who are already chosen we don't know who they are but what is our duty we have to evangelize to everyone and you know how god works is he will reveal himself to the elect at his appointed time i at the appointed place and through one of us who are appointed to share the gospel to him and it could even be from him reading just a passage of scripture right and he could understand that he is part of the elect see god will reveal himself to the elect in his own way in his own way and for us we should not keep thinking how is this going to happen all we are called to do is evangelize and you know there may be uh, seekers here even within our church who are coming you know who 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 know this concept of what is uh christ and who is christ and what is the sacrifice he has done for us they are seekers who know that they could be part of the elect but they've not come to that point of understanding of committing their lives and it is our duty to show them love and to show them that you can to be a uh, part of the elect you can be to accepted into the beloved and you know the same word of god which talks about election also talks about man's responsibility man's responsibility is also there to respond to the gospel we have a capacity to choose we have the capacity to receive the jesus our lord jesus christ as our savior you know god's sovereignty and man's responsibility go hand in hand election teaches us that the the seeker will know that he is part of the elect by his response to the gospel he will know it when he responds to the gospel and eventually he will believe i'll just i'll just read two verses and i hope that this will give us more um, understanding of what this means first thessalonians 1 4 to 7 knowing beloved your election by god verse 4 says know your election by god for our gospel did not come to you only in word but also in power in the holy spirit and you became followers of us and of the lord having received the word having received the word so you see here in the same passage you see it talks about the election of god and also talks how the gospel will come through the word and then we will then become followers of god we will become followers of god if when we are if and when we are part of the elect first peter 1 and 1 verse 2 God the Father knew and he chose long ago and his spirit has made you holy as a result as a result you have obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of our lord jesus so you know i just want to make one more disclaimer that you know as i said you know god's sovereignty works hand in hand with our man's responsibility and that man's responsibility is also we cannot take election as a excuse to say oh you know i don't need to evangelize i don't need to share the gospel that is a wrong uh, teaching and wrong notion and there are some churches who have done that and you know uh, it is also not an excuse to say you know what brother i'm not able to commit because i'm not part of the elect uh, i think i think we're crossing lines to to say that you know i know what is god's plan right but it is our responsibility to share and and, uh, and we hope that those who will listen will be saved so why how and why is this election possible you know it is in him so that we should be holy you know it says the right in that verse right so that we should be holy and without blame and that is the purpose of us to be before him in love verse 5 having predestined us to adoption as sons by 
Jesus Christ to himself. Now, we, also, we already saw election. Now we see predestination. Now, predestination is not the same as election or being chosen. Predestination explains to us how and when the chosen were selected. How and when. And this was way past before time was even created, even before the foundation of the earth. So it's not like as God goes by, he decides, okay, I'm going to add him to the elect. Let him, let this person also be added to the plan. It is not like that. They were chosen well before. Predestination confirms and tells us that God chose us way before at the foundation of the earth. And you know, uh, it also talks about how we are predestined to be adopted into his family. And we look at adoption also in a few minutes. In Romans 9.29 it says, For God knew his people in advance and he chose them before to become like his son. Chose us, predestined us. Why? To become like his son. Verse 5 continues, Adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. You know, you we, we can ask, why is this? Why is God predestining us? Why is he adopting us? And it is because of the good pleasure of his will. Because he chooses to select us. He chooses to add us to his family. You know, when, when a child is adopted, mostly when they're very young, you know, they don't get a choice on who will come and adopt them. It is always the other way around. The adopted, adopt, uh, the, the family who is adopting is the one who goes and selects a child and takes a child and puts them into their family. And that is the same thing with our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 5, as we see, adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. I'll just read Galatians 4. 4 to 7 and in Galatians 4 4 to 7 this is what it says God sent forth his son born of a woman to redeem those who were under the law that we should receive the adoption as sons we are receiving adoption as sons therefore we are no longer a slave but a son and if a son then a heir to God through Jesus Christ through Jesus Christ we are adopted into the family of God and that is only possible through Christ. So believers, at the point of redemption and the saving knowledge we have received, at that point we were adopted into God's family right away. And when we, were, when we are adopted, we have a legal right now to call our Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father. You know, we didn't have that personal relationship before, but now... With our Father God, we can call him Abba, Father, our Father. And it's not just a legal right, you know, because we have a Lord Jesus, our, our, our Father God, who has purchased us with a precious price. He has reconciled us. We were lost, right? And he has brought us back into the fold. So we have to be humble to appreciate that he has brought us back. Out of the multitudes, he has chosen us and adopted us. And this should give us immense joy to understand that we are part of this uh, heavenly family. And not only closeness to this father, apart from that, what is it? Our father also gives us an eternal inheritance, which we will learn shortly. We, will, we are going to get an eternal inheritance. And again, the question raises why and how. And this is through Christ, in Christ. And why? Because of the good pleasure of his will. We'll move on to the next section and that is, you know, once a, um, a child is adopted, there is, a, there is a time process which happens for that child to be accepted by that family. It's not going to be easy, right? It's a new human being coming into that family, into that home. And that takes time for acceptance for the extended family. For the child also to accept these new, the new parents. But in this case, we are accepted into the beloved immediately immediately to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he christ made us accepted in the beloved accepted in the beloved we just sang that only by grace can we enter you know so apt for this because it's only through the glory of grace of our lord that we have access and we have accepted into the beloved so because we are now accepted through the sacrifice of our lord jesus we are not only adopted, we are also accepted. And we are accepted into this beloved family. 
and this acceptance does not mean just acceptance by god but we will have acceptance into the family which is here as well we too have to accept new believers as christ accepts uh, each one of us and you know th- this word ec- beloved what does it remind us of doesn't it remind us of christ who was called as this is my beloved son we look at that verse mark 1:11 says then the voice came from heaven you are my beloved son in whom i am well pleased and you know we should when we put these two together we should understand that we share that acceptance which christ has and we are beloved as christ is the beloved of god the father we too are the beloved of god the father how amazing right we are accepted into the beloved along with our lord jesus christ so why you know why why is this uh that we are accepted we are adopted um why is this and this is the first time there is there is an action here and that action is in verse 6 which says to the pra- praise of the glory of his grace to the praise of the glory of his grace the reason that uh paul is explaining this to the to the to the people or to the saints at ephesus is so that they can understand the depth and weightage of what our father god and lord jesus christ and the holy spirit has done for each one of us and the only answer that can be from us is to praise him and to thank him and this is the only action which comes out from us so that we can acknowledge all of these truths and praise him we'll move forward in verse 7 in verse 7 says in him we have redemption through his blood we have redemption through his blood again through the blood of christ and here we see the focus shifts now to the son we see that the focus is now to the son <coughs> yeah now redemption is another beautiful term which is a more a legal term because when we say redemption christ has freed us from the guilt and burden which we had he has paid the price for that guilt and bondage and the punishment of our sins and what has he given us he has given us life and freedom in christ life and freedom in christ and what is the payment the payment was blood his blood is what the payment was for that ransom and you know this this is this reminds reminds us of of the story of this judge i just want to share a quick story of it's it's a it's about a judge who sits on a on his high table right and as he sits there he pronounces judgment on a culprit and he says that you have been convicted of your crimes and you will be put to death and after he passes that judgment and hits the gavel and he come he gets up which they usually don't do he gets up and he walks down he takes off his robe he puts it down and he tells the convict looking at him he says because i am a good judge i have to follow the law and i have to convict you of your sins and because of that convict you and because of that that conviction is death and i had to pronounce death on you but because i also love you and because i am your father i will take your place and you will be spared and this is is the is 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 what our father god has done for us you know he took our place and even though there was death looming over us he has granted us life and our lord jesus christ has taken the death and punishment upon himself and this is also seen in john 10:14 to 18 that's why the lord jesus christ has has said this and this is what he says i am the good shepherd i know my sheep and i know my very own i lay down my life for my sheep and the other sheep which is not of this fold them also will i bring in they will hear my voice and they will be one flock and one shepherd he goes on to say no one takes my life from me i lay it down by myself and i have power to lay it down and i have power to take it again and this is our lord jesus christ who has given us redemption and that redemption is where he paid the price for each one of our sins and then we'll move on to the next phrase which is forgiveness and in forgiveness we see that 
the forgiveness is an outcome of this redemption the price which is already paid verse 7 says the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace again so many aspects of this we heard this morning al- already the richness of his grace which made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence so our lord jesus our lord god in all wisdom and prudence has given us forgiveness and this forgiveness was again if you look a phrase back is through the blood of christ through the blood of christ you know forgiveness is an outcome of redemption and without redemption none of us would have got this forgiveness you know there is no free lunch right a price had to be paid and this forgiveness is continuous right this is how we go back to our lord and we ask for forgiveness what is 1 john 1 9 say right we, it says that if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness so we are called to ask for forgiveness and go back to him for forgiveness and this verse clearly says there's a richness of his grace you know there is a storehouse of rich rich grace which we can go to and from that grace is where we get unlimited forgiveness this does not mean that we misuse this right in romans 5:20 it says where sin abounded grace abounded much more so i hope that we understand that this grace should not be taken lightly because the next verse says for this reason should we continue in sin no definitely not we'll move on to the next verse and that's in verse 9 and that is he has made his mystery of his will revealed to us there's redemption and mystery of his will has been revealed to us verse 9 having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself in himself the this you know this mystery is not some mystery tale or something which is a fable but these are truths which were always there but these were not yet revealed to the christ followers the christians did not understand this yet because they had to attain some maturity in christ and this was the right time for paul to write this letter to the ephesian church and when he reveals this whatever we are learning today and what we will learn going forward in the next few chapters as well will help us understand uh, more about our god more about our savior and these are the mysteries he is talking about the secrets of his grace which are being revealed to us and to the ephesian church and you know why why is this you know he doesn't have to keep all he he could have kept all this mysterious and you know only certain high priests sh- should be the ones who hold it you know some religions have hold on to that that only certain people know some amount of knowledge but here he wants each one of us you know w- what is addressed in the first verse if you look up it says we are all saints unto him right and we all have access to the riches which are in the word and each one of us can definitely understand it if we put our mind and apply our minds to it and it pleases god to help us understand who he is it pleases him for us to understand comprehend why so that we can appreciate him we will be able to appreciate him more if we understand these truths more verse 10 that in the dispensation of the fullness of time dispensation of the fullness of time this is the future millennium kingdom which he is speaking of and the fullness of time comes he that is christ will gather together all in one all things in christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him in him so this is talking about the future mystery which is to come and i'm sure the efficient church would have been as confused much more confused than us because it's the first time they're hearing this we have the revelation and much more we've already read but this must have been so um so exciting and new for the efficient church right and this is the millennial kingdom where our lord jesus will reign as the king of kings you know in isaiah 9 also it talks about this but there's a small difference in isaiah isaiah 9 verse 6 to 7 in isaiah 9 6 to 7 it says for a child will be born to us a son will be given to us and the government will be on his shoulders and his name will be called wonderful counselor mighty god eternal father prince of peace prince of peace because he will create peace on earth which 
we have not had for generations. There will be no in end to the increase of his government or peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom. And you know, when we read this, it was about his reign on earth. But now we have a new or added revelation where he will have dominion even in heaven, which is in heaven and on earth. And this is going to be our Lord Jesus Christ who will have dominion over everything. Let's move on to verse 11. Verse 11 says, In him we also, we have obtained an inheritance. In verse 11, 12 and 13, there are three phrases there which starts off, it starts off with. It says, we have obtained, we who first trusted, and this is referring to Paul and his companions who are Jews, who first received the gospel. And here he says that we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. We have trusted in Christ first, so that we should be the praise of his glory. But now in verse 13 he says, You also, you also, meaning Gentiles, Greeks, us, who did not have access to this holy God. We also have heard the truth, the gospel of our salvation. We also have heard it. In verse 14, it again changes. It says, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. Our inheritance. Now we are all one. There is no Jew, there is no Greek, there is no Gentile. We are all one under Christ. In him, we are all one. We all have heard of Jesus. We all have believed and we all have been brought together into one family. You know, we read about that uh, uh, that uh, Abrahamic covenant, right? And how the, the Jews are confused. And here, uh, if you turn to Galatians 3 verse 16, Paul is correcting them. And this uh, letter to the Galatians is prior to the letter to the Ephesians. And here, he wants to, you know, reiterate to them, you know, what you're reading is wrong. And he says there in 3.16, Galatians 3.16, he does not say and two seeds as to many, but as of one, and that your seed who is in Christ, your seed. And he adds on, as he goes on in verse 28 and 29, he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is no, neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you all, we all are one in Christ. Now that we belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. God's promise to Abraham belongs to all of us. We'll move on to verse 13. Verse 13 talks about the Holy Spirit. And now we move to the last part, which is about the Holy Spirit in verse 13 and 14. In him you also trusted after you, having heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. This is the third time that phrase comes to the praise of his glory. We'll look at that in a minute. The phrases you need to look at here are in the end of 13 and 14. You were sealed by the Holy Spirit, the guarantee of our inheritance and the redemption of the purchased possession. Now, what is beautiful here is Paul again knows his audience. We have seen that in the past in Acts, right? He changes his his uh, messages as per where he is talking. Now, when he's talking to Ephesians, remember I told you Ephesus was a center of business. Trade used to come in from Asia, spices, silk, cloth, I don't know, um, whatever comes from Asia and goes to Europe, right? Which is not available in Europe. And all these spices and essential oils which come to Ephesus and then go to Rome, they come to a marketplace. And when they come to a marketplace, Servants of masters back in Rome would come to the marketplace and purchase those goods. When they purchase those goods, there is no, there is no counterfoil, there is no uh, online tracking, none of that, right? 
the way they did it is they wrapped it all up they tied it all up made a big knot put wax and put a seal and when they put a seal on that on that goods which is supposed to go from here to rome they don't need to always travel with it all they do is they put the seal and once they put that seal of the master once it reaches there in the port of rome the master when he receives it he looks at that purchased possession and he is able to redeem it from the port looking just at that seal and now look at those phrases right we are sealed with that holy spirit he is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession and when we go into those pearly gates we will be warmly welcomed because we have the seal of the holy spirit we have been sealed by the holy spirit and we are his prized possession we are the prized possession of our heavenly father let's look at that word inheritance little more so we are his inheritance we are his purchased possession and our inheritance also is christ our inheritance is eternity in heaven i our prized possession and inheritance is to be in his presence you know an inheritance was very important in those days because they didn't have to do uh, bba and mba and then go for a job they had to take over what their father did and that was their inheritance they waited for that inheritance to take it over and what is our inheritance our inheritance is what we see in revelation 21 and you see that it says no more death no more sorrow no more crying no more pain everything will be made new we will be in a bejeweled city the new jerusalem this will be our eternal residence and god himself will dwell with us god himself will dwell with us and man will be with their god we will be with our god so our, the holy spirit has sealed us he has made us his precious possession we have this guarantee in him and this is our security and this should be our joy so we've come to the end of this passage and you see why are these blessings and you see that in that phrase in 6 12 and 14 which says to the praise of the glory of his grace this is the reason god wants us to use these truths to appreciate what he has done for us to praise him and exalt him you know in in ephesians 1 we will see a prayer the next step is a prayer that is from 15 to 23 and this prayer is to help us experience the power of the gospel and experience this lord jesus so in the next slide we'll just look at what are these blessings i didn't make the 10 up it came to 10 points okay i didn't force it there may be more points and i hope there'll be more there, there cannot be anything less there may be more points and more blessings you will be able to find in this passage and i hope you will see that in the time to come when you uh, sit with your with your uh, care groups what are the blessings that we see in these 11 verses he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places it's not material blessings but spiritual eternal blessings and these blessings are he chose us before the world was created he predestined us he adopted us he has accepted us into the beloved he has redeemed us he has forgiven us and he's re- revealing the mystery of his will to us he's constantly revealing his will in our lives to us and we have obtained the guarantee of our inheritance and we are sealed with the holy spirit so brothers and sisters as we keep this in mind what what is our response to this why uh, is god trying to teach us this and it is very relevant even for us not just for the believers in ephesus you know there are two of the oldest manuscripts of uh, the letter to the ephesians are missing one uh, two just two words and there says to the saints full stop it doesn't say at ephesus and there is also one more um, manuscript which instead of ephesus says laodicea so the theory goes that this letter was so um, powerful 
that this letter was recreated, rewritten and sent to all the other churches so that they too could be encouraged. So this is meant for all believers. What is God trying to tell us? So those of us who are seated here who do have not given a commitment to our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ is, and, and our God the Father is calling us to say that the that his son has paid the price for your sins. Our Lord Jesus Christ has paid the price in full for our sins. And he all he asks us is to believe in the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when we put our trust in him, he is confirming us that we will be adopted into his family. We will be accepted into the beloved and we will be forgiven. And we will have an eternal inheritance in him in the heavenly places. So I urge those of you who are still seeking, who are still wanting to know more, you know, please reach out to us so that we can share from our lives and help you understand how our Lord Jesus Christ has purchased the pardon for each one of us and forgiven us of our sins. Church, Christians who are here, you have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel has been revealed to you and you have believed. This is the greatest blessing we could have ever got. The greatest blessing we could have ever got is to receive redemption, reconciliation, adoption into his family and being accepted into the beloved. What else can we ask for? Because you know this life we live here is just a fraction or a, or a, or a small dot in eternity. And the rest of eternity we have to spend in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ and to praise him. So you know the immediate future should seem irrelevantly futile, right? It should seem like that. I'm not trying to make things trivial, but if we are able to value Christ more, if we're able to value the these truths more, then the pain and sorrow we have in this lifetime will seem very minimal. Because we are then focused that we are only ambassadors of Christ to be here for a small season. And beyond that, what does the revelation say? No more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering. Are we looking forward to that? That is what our Lord God wants for us to have. A heart which understands that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. And we have a heart which has a guarantee, a guarantee which is to come. A future, beautiful future which is to come. If we don't understand that guarantee, if we don't understand that it is so sure that it can be any moment now, we, we will not be able to enjoy the life we have here. Everything will weigh us down. Anything and everything will weigh us down if we don't understand that these trials are nothing compared to the joy we will have in the future. Church, children of God, what is our response to this passage? You know, this is a wonderful passage for praise and worship. Why is Paul opening with this opening thought and wonderful declaration in his letter to the church at Ephesus. And like I said to any uh, believers, maybe the Ephesians are like us. Maybe, you know, they are just a bit laid back and they just want to come on a Sunday morning, just sit here and make sure that, that the presence is felt and I've done my duty, I've gone to church. But is that what is expected of us? If we understand this completely, Will we be content with just sitting here and not pondering on what things have been spoken? Have we, men, ha have you been encouraged and pushed by the Spirit to rise up and share? You know, this is a freedom not many churches have, and this is a freedom you have to stand up and share from your heart what God has laid on your heart. And you see, this morning, as many of the brothers stood up, we see the spirits leading and coming back just to the same passage. Everything I said here today, something has been touched on by many of the brothers who have come and this was not planned. And this is how the Holy Spirit works. And the Holy Spirit is encouraging us to praise and worship and for us to sit, be seated here with attentive thoughts to praise Him, to worship Him and thank Him. And also for our lives to be a living uh, a life which is worthy of his calling. Are, is our lives worthy of his calling? Are we glorifying him through our lives? That is the question which I want to leave with you today. Do we acknowledge the deep, deep love of our Savior and what he has given us? Do we acknowledge the work of the Son 
to take on the punishment of our sins upon himself and have we un- understood how the holy spirit has secured us and kept us in the beloved you know i just want to end with that this one phrase this one uh, you know it says the father god is the initiator of the work to redeem reconcile and accept man through the one time substitutionary sacrifice of the son and empower the presence of the holy spirit who will ga- who is the guarantee of our salvation and eternal inheritance you know i was just pondering on various things and i wrote i just wrote this together it may not make grammatical sense it may not be perfect but that's what god knows we are we are not perfect but he wants to hear what is from our heart he wants spontaneous worship which is original which is genuine he doesn't want us to write down a, a a huge liturgy and come and read it out and be zoned out he wants us to have emotions he wants us to understand what are these blessings he has blessed us with and with those blessings i hope our response as a church is to look at his face look at that cross and truly appreciate what he has done for each one of us so i'll leave you with that thought and we'll close in prayer before that i'll just look at just show you a couple of slides so this is what the passage looks like right it's a lot of words i hope all of you under, did some underlining some highlighting in your um in your digital bibles if you don't go back and do that before you go to a care group and you know if you break it down little more you will see god the father there the lord jesus christ there and the holy spirit there in three sections being spoken of and you also see the various um, blessings which i have highlighted in purple if you take one step further you see how he calls us to praise him to praise of his glory and how many times it says in christ by christ through christ so i hope that this will help us understand that a passage how confusing it can be it's not going to be that difficult if we put our mind to it if we ask the holy spirit to speak to us he will reveal things to us and i'm not saying everything was revealed to me please go back to your care groups learn more from this passage and appreciate this triune god who has come together to work and bring and reconcile each one of us back into one family under our lord jesus christ shall we give thanks <clears throat> lord heavenly father we thank you and praise you lord for your word which is so true rele- relevant and available to us uh, lord as it was centuries back we thank you lord that we too uh, we are like the church at ephesus we too are at times lost we too do not focus on who you are and we thank you lord for these reminders which you help us understand the blessings which are in christ jesus and we pray lord that we will appreciate these blessings we will understand these various truths and uh, we will come together lord uh, to discuss with one another in our own care groups and we'll understand who our lord jesus christ is and what is our fitting response to our triune god who has reconciled us redeemed us and accepted us as his own as his very own we thank you lord for this and we thank you lord for the assurance of salvation you give us the seal of the holy spirit which is upon us by which we can call you abba father and by which we know that we have an eternal inheritance in you so we commit this time forward and we ask for all of this lord in and through name for lord and savior jesus christ amen